Hello, Grace Steel Nation. Sully here with another research <coughs> review for you. Uh, I'm joined by a good friend and Grace Steel Research Review faculty, CJ Gocher, uh, Barbell Logic Online Coaching Staff Coach, recently appointed Barbell Logic uh, Coaching Academy Director, and occasional miscreant. Uh, he was part of my Wayward Band of Science Committee misfits from 2016 to 2019, where he did good service. He knows how to read the literature, and we're always pleased to have him on. Thank you for joining us, CJ. Thank you. And we're joined for the first time by Vicki Volkov. Uh, she is joining us today from Israel. Uh, she's a Bachelor of Physical Education, a Master of Science in Medical Sciences at the Department of Anatomy. She's a strength coach, a teacher of massage therapy, assistant teacher of anatomy and kinesiology, and um, doctoral candidate. We're still dialing in our research review, and uh, this may be the shape of things to come, uh, where we do one or two papers at a time. It's likely to make it easier for me and my faculty uh, to do more papers. We'll never be able to do as many as we like, but I think this may help. So you can expect to see more of us, especially myself. I'll be doing some as one-offs, and um, hopefully I'll be doing uh, quite a few with Vicky as well. Um, the paper today we're going to talk about um, is um, a paper that's been running around the interwebs, the Generation 100 study. This is Stenchfold et al., uh, from Norway. The title is The Effect of Exercise Training for Five Years on All-Cause Mortality in Older Adults, the Generation 100 Study, a randomized controlled trial. This is in the BMJ 2020, hot off the presses, and it's open access, so if you're interested, you can download and read the paper, which I would encourage you to do. Uh, papers making the rounds is being variously touted as showing the superiority of high intensity interval training or HIT and the importance of intensity overall in an exercise prescription uh, compared with aerobic or medium intensity continuous training and Norwegian standard exercise recommendations. Uh, so that's a perspective towards which I think all three of us are favorably biased. Uh, we like HIT and we like intensity. But the gold standard for truth isn't something we want to be true, but rather what the data and evidence actually tell us. So is that what this data actually tells us? Let's get right to the paper chase here, and let's ask Vicki to present how this study was put together. Take it away, Vicki. Thank you, Sully, and thank you for the introduction. I'm very excited to be here with the both of you. Um, so I'll present the primary hypothesis, which was that systematic exercise training lowers all-cause mortality compares, compared with giving advice to follow the national guidelines for physical activity. They also had an exploratory hypothesis which mentioned that high-intensity interval, interval training lowers mortality and risk factors for several conditions more than moderate-intensity continuous training does. So how did they do that? The methods part. So the RCTs participants were about uh, 1,567 uh, healthy active adults between the ages 70 and 77 from Trondheim, Norway. Among them were 790 women, which were about 50% of the sample. They were randomized into three groups, a moderate intensity continuous group called briefly MICT, uh, which was consisted of 378 uh, participants, Second group was a high intensity interval group, which was called briefly HIIT, and was consisted of 400 participants. And the third group was the control group, consisted of 780 participants, and all interventions lasted for five years from uh, 2013 and 2018. So participants were allocated to the control group, were asked to follow the Norwegian physical activity guidelines, for the same year, 2012, which stated 30 minutes of moderate level physical activity almost every day. It was mentioned that no further supervision was given in that group. Participants randomized to HIIT and MICT groups were asked to weekly exchange two of the five 30 minutes physical activity sessions with two HIIT sessions or MICT sessions according to their group's allocation. The HIIT group was instructed to perform a light 10-minute warm-up followed by four intervals of four minutes each at about 90% of peak heart rate corresponding to rating of perceived exertion of about 16 on the Borg scale. 
from six for no exertion to 20 for maximum exertion. And the three minute break between intervals were active. They were supposed to exercise at about 60 to 70% of peak heart rate at about 12 on the Berg scale. Uh, the MICT sessions included 50 minutes of continuous work at about 70% of, heart, of peak heart rate, which was a talking pace, corresponding to rating of perceived exertion of about 13. Study protocol mentioned that the activity type performed varied between seasons of the year and included indoor and outdoor activities such as walking, running, cross-country skiing, and aerobics. No group differences were observed at baseline, and in total, 87.5% of participants reported overall good health. Study protocol also mentioned that the participants in the study are more active, were more active, uh, had higher education level and better health compared with the non-participant group. Um, as to supervision, every sixth week, both groups met separately for supervised spinning sessions with an exercise physiologist where they were, ex uh, they were exercised with, with heart rate monitors to ensure recommended exercise intensities were being achieved. Supervised training with exercise physiologists was also offered twice a week in different outdoor areas, and the intensity was evaluated by heart rate monitor and rating of perceived exertion. Um, participants in the exercise groups were asked to fill an exercise in exercise logs immediately after each exercise session and send all the logs uh, to the research center. But how, however, researchers stopped requiring, requiring daily exercise logs after one year, as several participants found them a burden to complete and this affected their motivation to participate. Um, I think that will be all for the method section. Okay, thank you, Vicky. Uh, well done. And um, CJ? Uh, Vicky's told us the methods, how the study was put together. Pretty good summary there. What did they find? So just like, uh, just like Vicky did, I intend to go straight through the, the uh, findings and conclusions without much in the way of commentary. We can discuss that later. So just going through the top, the, the top characteristics first, they actually looked through a lot of different uh, variables and contingencies and different things. Let's start with mortality. So uh, in short, it looks like a complete fail. The combined group had a 4.5% mortality. The control group had 4.7% mortality. No statistically significant differences there. When they broke apart the separate groups, HIT had a, or the HIIT had a 3% mortality and the MICT had a 5.9% mortality. So the HIIT group, uh, as, as some people have commented, trended towards significance. We'll talk about that later. Trended, um, but it was like half the mortality right? But it was half the mortality. So it yeah. gets almost, yeah, almost. So it gets to the question of how that happens. And the MICT group actually had higher mortality than the control group. Right. Uh, so when we look at the combined group and the fact that they were at 4.5%, it's actually in part because the, the hit is moderating the MICT and essentially they're meeting in the middle. Right. For uh, sub-characteristics, so CVD and cancer. Uh, they were no statistically significant differences for cardiovascular disease uh, or cancer in any of the groups. They were all right around 12% for cancer uh, and right around 15% for CVD. Um, the interesting thing to note is that the differences between the incidence of CVD and the death rate by CVD. So about 15% incidence, averaging about 0.75 death rate. Very low percentages uh, of the subject or the study participants actually died of a uh, cardiovascular related, related incident. In cancer, about 12% incidence, so a lower incidence than CVD, but a much higher death rate and about 3%. Uh, and one of the comments from the study is that of the 263 participants with a history of cancer, 21 died all from cancer. Of the 273 with CVD at baseline, 16 died, only two from CVD. Interesting. So, uh, and I'll, I'll kind of talk to, talk to that a little bit later because that was touted as one of the results of the study is that perhaps there's a, a cardiovascular delay mechanism involved or a protective mechanism uh, from this type of training. We'll see. Uh, the quality were, of life. Okay, I was gonna say there are other outcome metrics too, the quality of life and the uh, uh, oxygen uptake. 
Yep. So for quality of life, they used uh, the SF26 and the SF8, a survey, you know, a, a verified survey, blah, 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 to qualify uh, and quantify uh, changes in physical and mental uh, capacity over the five years. And what they came to was a small improvement uh, from HIT at the five-year point. So it wasn't statistically significant until the five-year point. When they got to the five-year point, it was statistically significant over the MICT and over the control groups. That difference was small. So on a score scale, uh, where the control group was scoring 50.1 on physical score, uh, the HIIT group was only scoring 51.4. There was only a 1.3 difference. Uh, and then for uh, mental, 53.8 was control, 54.5. So only a 0.7 difference. So because we have such a, you know, because we have a pretty narrow variance in those reported numbers, uh, we do get statistical significance at a very small amount. To look into their conclusions, they cited another study which investigated the clinical relevance of PCS and MCS numbers, what it takes but what the difference would have to be for it to actually be clinically relevant. Mm -hmm. And the answer was about 3.3 .3 to 3.7. So these conclusions are statistically significant, not likely clinically relevant. Right. The, the, the gap post is between a, a statistically significant difference and a clinically significant difference. Strikes again. Um, the, uh, so uh, the authors made the defense that this is policy significant over the uh, scope of a larger population. This might be relevant, but that becomes one of those, you know, nuanced and, and massaged in the discussions. Uh, VO2 peak was compared between the two groups. MICT uh, combined uh, or hit and combined beat control. MICT didn't really seem to improve VO2 very much. Uh, and there was a pretty dramatic increase, like a, a quite noticeable increase in VO2 peak in the HIIT group. Finally, there was the dropout numbers. So uh, these were just the straight, the number of uh, subjects who dropped out. Control was 20%, and we would expect a relatively low dropout because they're not doing anything. You know, they're just doing what the uh, national guidelines, they were just told something to do, and they report every year for a physical checkup and consultation. MICT group showed 26% dropout. HIIT group showed a 33% dropout. So these were uh, pretty meaningful differences in how many subjects continue to adhere to the protocol. The investigators suggested that a lot of this may have been because of the uh, higher barrier to entry of a daily journal uh, and some other things that they corrected. So after the first year, the subjects were no longer required to daily journal their physical activity. It's important to note uh, uh this might properly belong a little bit later in the commentary, but I do want to point it out now that the dropout rate um, um, didn't affect the validity of the results because the authors did an intention to treat analysis of their data. So in other words, everyone uh, who entered a particular arm of the study was included in the analysis of that study, whether they dropped out or not. So, and I thought that was a, an excellent uh, a point of methodology. Anything else on the results, CJ? So a couple of, uh, you know, kind of useful tidbits. Uh, besides the fact that there were uh, no differences or no statistically significances in the primary and secondary outcomes, which is one of those, that's the one that seems to be up in arms. Uh, safety was considered a big, uh, a big consideration. Uh, over the course of five years with a population from 70 to 77, only three participants uh, experienced fracture injuries. They were exercising on their own on a slippery surface uh, and there were no CVD incidents despite the, the training uh, frequency uh, during exercise for any of those groups. So, you know, nobody had a heart attack in the middle of working out. Exercising on a slippery surface. I think in Norway that means outdoors. Right, pretty much, yeah, any time after the rain. Um, okay, uh, anything else on there, on the um, results? So the rest, of, the rest for me is all commentary. There's, a, there's so much that gets caught up in different things. I'm, I'm, I'm excited to get to that part. Okay, um, Vic, what do you think about uh, the methodology of this paper? Do you think they designed a pretty good study? Uh, I think pretty much that um, the study is well uh, presented and uh, intention was good, <laughs> uh -huh. but uh, 
so the first thing that struck me is that uh, the AGIT protocol, four minutes of interval of high intensity interval of 90% of heart rate of peak heart rates, that sounds not so logical. And because they were monitored only once uh, in about six weeks, they could just say, okay, I'm not feeling like uh, performing the 90%, so I'll just, maybe it's, uh, well, all the problematics uh, we have with uh, the RPE scale. So this was the first one that came up, and also the, um, the stopping of the logging of the exercise after one year, and then after it, we, we saw a drop in the graphs that uh, in, the, in the results section because the, we, we could not trust the, the, data, the data that uh, the participants uh, just, um, um, they just report. It's a report-based uh, data. And also, uh, they mentioned <laughs> a fun fact there that the crossover occurred between the interventions, particularly in the control group, meaning 23, 22, and 80% of participants changed to AGIT after one, three, and five years, respectively. And this also happened in the MICT group, the, but it, was, it happened in the, a bit lower rates. 12, that's right, that's and, right. And, you know, a, lot of, a lot of the control group participants kind of migrated into HIT on mm -hmm. their own, right? So was it really a control group then? You know, was it uh, was it a good was it a good control? That's an excellent point, Vicky. What else? And um, the control group was actually pretty active. Um, they reported that uh, their their uh, level of activity was somewhere between the MICT and the AGIT group. Uh, and I asked myself, well, if if um, the study rationale was to uh, to uh, look for uh, a statistically significant preventive effect on premature all-cause mortality. So why did, didn't, I, didn't they take an inactive control group? I couldn't have said it better myself. Like one of the things that really jumps out at me about this paper is, is the lack of a sedentary control. Um, uh, and uh, I, I, I think that's huge. I think, you're, I think you're right on there. There's no sedentary control. And the control group that they did have it, it was already pretty active. Uh, and they said, yeah, you just, you just keep, you just keep being active. CJ, what do you think? So for me, the biggest uh, confounding factor for the study is that uh, the selection effect. And when you have only 6,000 or so population, you reach out to literally all of them, which is, you know, nice that you can do that, I guess, with a, with a, you know, communal healthcare, I suppose, uh, and only people who volunteer uh, who can be included in your study, it makes sense. It's a built-in limitation. There's also dramatic differences built into that. So uh, I went looking into uh, Norway's average CVD rates, average smokers, average this, and they reported in the study protocol what the non-participants, uh, what they were like, and the non-participants were like standard Norwegian 70-year-olds. So 12 to 15% smokers, you know, uh, less active, higher uses of medication, higher uses of, like dramatically. So we do, we do end up with that factor. You flatten the results by having this, this control group. Uh, I thought that the migration from, of the groups was actually, it was something of a strength of the study uh, in that they told them what to do. And every six weeks, they inform them, like, yes, you're dialed in on this bike. Like, this is your intensity zone. So, sure, okay, they do actually get some kind of training in RPE. And some and feedback, works. yeah. And some feedback. That's kind of cool. But then they ask them, what did you do? And they ask them in a different way. So they don't tell them, did you do what we told you to? Which is just asking for, you know, for them to say, yeah. They ask them, how many minutes a week did you spend high intensity, moderate intensity, low intensity? And they, so they, it was still self-reported, which is uh, frustrating. But uh, we got to see the effect of an intervention telling them what to do and monitoring them on their activity, on their self-reported activity. And what we saw was, uh, or at least one thing that I found interesting 
was the intervention groups saw less and less activity over time. So the control group stayed at relatively the same uh, number of people adhering to uh, general physical activity guidelines, right around 30 to 35%. Uh, by the end of it, the HIIT group had gone down from 37% to 28%. And the MICT group had gone from 40% to 31% in terms of people who were actually adhering even to the Norwegian physical activity guidelines. So we see like this almost brief excitement, that initial novice effect, I guess we could call it, from participation in the study. And then dropouts, fadeaways. That struck me too. It's an, it's an interesting phenomenon, but it's not a phenomenon that the study was designed to observe. The study was designed to discriminate between the effect on mortality of MICT and HIT and standard Norwegian exercise uh, uh, protocols. And, and so, you know, it, it did pick up on these, on these various epi epiphenomena, like people migrating from one protocol to another, but it didn't really, I don't feel like it really did a very good job of distinguishing between different intensities or modalities of exercise and any sort of metric. Uh, is that fair? The only, the only significant, and I mean statistically significant, clinically significant, and really in terms of adherence group in this study was the, the HIT group. Right. They showed, they showed a VO2 peak increase that was not only statistically significant, but reasonably like- Reasonably like, clinically significant, yeah. Yeah. Reasonably clinically significant. Um, the differences in PCS and MCS, not clinically significant. Uh, I, I always, ugh, when people start talking about trending towards significance uh, or, but there's an interesting thing that happened here and it's the, probably the biggest error they made statistically. They had to assume what the likely mortality was going to be to calculate their statistical power. So they said, they said they were looking for the, the effect size that they were prepared to detect was a 50% decrease in mortality. That's huge for an intervention over five years in that population. So they, they needed a lot of people and they got more than they needed. They needed 600 in each group and they got about 700 to 800 in each group. Uh, but the statistical power was based on the assumption that they were gonna see 10% mortality. So Which when you see 5% five, 5 mortality in the control over five years, you have so fewer inc incidents you will have a you will have a bias towards flattening, a bias towards you know any real effect uh, disappearing. So between the statistical error, which I don't know if they could have predicted or not, and the the selection bias, okay. they shot themselves in the foot in terms of significance. Yeah, I think I do. I think so. I think they cooked themselves a, l a little bit here. Um, I, I, referring to my own notes. Um, uh, External validity. So this is a very healthy, uh, homogeneous uh, population. What is the external validity of this study, even uh, assuming we can invest a lot in these findings to say a North American population or an Eastern European population? You know, is there, is there external validity here um, to our listeners? So basically, what I see here is they had, they took a population, a study population that already had a very robust longevity and, uh, and potential subjects with chronic degenerative diseases of aging, like hypertension, heart failure, dementia, they were not recruited, right? Uh, it isn't bad, but they took, they took a healthy population that was already exercising. And then they said, yeah, keep on exercising and maybe do some hit you know, and let's see what happens to you in, in five years. And uh, what can we really take from that kind of design? Vic? I just want to add that uh, they mentioned in the statistics that in the city of uh, Trondheim, 2% of the population between 70 and 77 years old, they died, uh, the people who died during uh, 2012, uh, the expected mortality rate after five years should have been approximately 10%. That, that was the base to their cal calculation, but it was based on the, the whole population. 
of the 700 uh, people who were invited to participate in the study. But the ones who did participate in the study were the, the healthy ones. So the they calculation... Had, yeah, they had only half or a third as much of the mortality as the general population. So yeah. I guess we can take that, right? So that, you know, people who, who exercise and keep exercising seem to have a lower all-cause mortality. Um, CJ, do you believe the results about HIT? Do you believe that there is an actual um, effect of HIT that we can peel out of these? Do, do you, when you look at this data, do you think that the authors have done the job of demonstrating that intensity has an effect on all-cause mortality in, an ex in a population that's already exercising? I have, I have gone in circles since starting to look at this study from this is complete bullshit to, to like, this is a really interesting finding back to bullshit, back to interesting finding. Um, I think it is anytime you can't get statistical significance from an intervention, especially in a population that's already healthy, I've got to ask myself, where's the relevant to the 75% of the population that wouldn't participate in your study. And that feels like the kind of people we're really trying to reach. And so my question becomes, uh, are they, are they going to actually <laughs> write? This happens. <laughs> are they actually going to participate? Could you actually get them to do HIT? Could you get them to do MICT? Um, but even barring that, so getting rid of that and the fact that that's what I kind of personally care about, within a healthy population, I think the VO2 peak conclusion is interesting. And I think the mortality trend towards significance, but the actual, the differences in HIIT results and mortality without a concurrent difference in CBD and cancer risk. I think there is, a, I wouldn't say that this is, you know, any kind of conclusive proof by any means, but I think there is aligning with previous research and aligning with previous conclusions, there's a, a suggestive value here that increasing VO2 peak and physical capacity through HIT uh, is the contributing factor to that mortality. If there is an effect here, and I'm going to say if, because we don't, unfortunately, it's uh, there are too many issues to say. I agree. If there, is, if there is an effect here, it comes from that greater work capacity, that greater physical resilience, that greater interaction with the world, not from disease prevention. Vicki, what do you think? Do, do the author... Do the authors make a good case with their data that HIT actually has uh, an effect on all-cause mortality? Or do you think that we're looking at, you know, just a, a statistical variance, statistical noise, an epiphenomenon? What are we looking at here? Um, I think the protocol was not uh, conducted in a way that... Uh, we have uh, we have uh, could conducted it better, uh, so we could have seen even more significant results or statistically significant results. But um, I don't know if uh, we can take something from this study to the general population, um, the population that that we work with, the, and uh, that, and that really needs it. The population that's, that's the population not, that really needs it, right? Yeah. Okay, um, so uh, again, looking at my notes, uh, some of this has already been brought up. Uh, we talked about external validity. Outcome metrics were all-cause mortality, VO2 max, VO2 peak. Also, there was some data on cancer and cardiovascular disease. I thought the cancer, looking at cancer was a Hail Mary. Uh, I'm actually, I, I do. I, I think that, um, you know, there is some data saying that exercise um, the regular exercise decreases rates of cancer in all comers. I don't think that's particularly strong data. Uh, I'm pretty unclear on what the mechanism would be for that, maybe free radical scavenging and so forth. Um, but to try and detect the difference between HIT and MICT on cancer as a contributor to all-cause mortality over the course of five years I thought that, like, like that was a little bit of a reach. Um, the all-cause mortality, VO2 max, VO2 peak, those were interesting and relevant. Not, um, not 
particularly inclusive of other things. They do report this quality of life uh, self-report form. I don't know how robust uh, that form or data is. Perhaps you looked into that, CJ, but um, I'm a little bit unclear uh, on that. Again, as you pointed out, the dropout rate was highest in the HIT group. Um, I thought that the use of an intention to treat analysis was excellent. Um, standard uh, analysis of survival by Kaplan-Meier analysis, that was good. There was no, this wasn't pointed out, there was no MICT only group, unless I read this wrong, right? There was a, there was a combined MICT hit group, am I right? They separated out the, there was, a, uh, there was an MICT group and they separated it out, but 90% of the time it performed worse than the combined group or it performed exactly at the same level as the combined Did group. Did I read this wrong? Uh, it wouldn't be the first time I read something wrong, but what, what I thought was <clears throat> that they randomized, um, they randomized them to either, uh, no, you're right. So I did read that wrong, okay? And uh, adherence was not great, uh, ranged around half for all groups, that's a problem. But again, they really uh, covered themselves with the intention to treat analysis. Um, and the particular exercise modalities and movement patterns were not specified or prescribed. So people did all kinds of stuff, right? So there was no standardization of exercise modality. and. For our viewers, I have to point out that resistance exercise, as far as I can tell, there's no mention of resistance exercise or strength training in this paper at all. Um, and for reasons that we have belabored ad nauseum, um, I think that's important in this population. Um, and, um, and that's what I have. So the big problem I see here, and you guys can take issue with me if you want, um, this was a study in which elderly but very active, healthy, homogeneous population that was already exercising kept exercising. Um, the study groups got more hit or a mix of hit and MICT compared to the control group, which was unsupervised. And many of those in the control group also did hit. So it's kind of like you're like you're testing a medicine and you have a control group and you have the medicine group. And you give some of the high dose medicine to the control group too because they wanted it, you know. And how does that how does that impact your study? How does you know? It seems like that's a poor control. So we had three healthy active groups with a fairly low all cause mortality to begin with, really good health, and after five years of continuing a healthy lifestyle, plus or minus tweaks, they still had a fairly low all cause mortality and relatively good health. So. The way the study is being spun is that it shows that older adults should do more high intensity exercise. And I think that's right. And I think probably you think that's right. But I would just point out that, first of all, we already knew that. And also, I don't think the study actually demonstrates that. Um, it just supports it um, because of the issues with the study design that we've already pointed out. And it doesn't tell us how to administer HIT or its dosing or its progression or its therapeutic targets. So I don't think this is a bad study at all. I think it's actually, you know, a, a very interesting study. I enjoyed looking at it. Um, it was very thought provoking. Uh, it's been kind of out there uh, making the rounds and generating some waves, but I'm not sure it's actually that much of a big deal. Guys? Well, it is the first RCT to evaluate the effect of exercise training on mortality in a general population of elderly people. They were very proud of it. And also they used pretty large sample size and long intervention period of five years. And they even offered the whole, the, all the inhabitants of the population of Trondheim to participate. So it was, um, it was a strength of this study. But uh, the conclusion, the implication in the discussion, this was something that bothered me a bit. They wrote that uh, either shorter duration vigorous uh, physical activity or longer duration moderate physical activity or a combination of the two amount to the same amount of work each week will have the same favorable health outcomes. 
with vigorous physical activity being the time efficient alternative. And we know this is not correct. F vigorous activity performed correctly does not amount longer duration physical activity. So it's just not right to, it, this is the common knowledge, but we know that's not true. They didn't, they didn't equalize work between these groups, right? There, there was no attempt to normalize total mm -hmm. work between the groups, was there? that I saw? They tried to create, the reason why they did the four by four, uh, the four minutes on, four minutes low intensity, <clears throat> instead of what we would normally consider to be a hit uh, kind of routine um, is because it went, in their supplemental materials, there's a study that shows that it's isocaloric. So they were trying to match for uh, the um, uh, metabolic total intensity of the prescribed sessions. But when you look at the, their self-reported minutes in each intensity zone, the groups were, were sometimes on, sometimes off. At year one, uh, hit, the hit group was reporting 170 minutes total, whereas everyone else was reporting 100. Like it was, uh, it, no one actually did what they were told consistently. So Vicky, you kind of schooled me there. Uh, I mean, you make a good point. Is it, uh, they, they recruited a lot of subjects into uh, a longitudinal study over five years. So in that respect, it is pioneering, right? A big RC, a big long RCT of exercise um, and the effect on all cause mortality. Um, but uh, so in that, so in that respect, I think we have to tip our hat to them, but I want you guys to sum up. What can we, what can we actually take from this that is practice changing or policy changing? What do we actually get out of this? Vicki? Uh, I frankly don't know. Uh, it has nothing to add to my practice, except, um, well, the, the, the things we already know that uh, AGIT seems to be, to have a more, uh, more advantages over moderate intensi uh, intensity exercise. So I don't know what to add. CJ? Because I come from a place of a preferring hit in general, it doesn't change too much how I would coach a client. Uh, some things do come up from a policy perspective. So the biggest thing that came up was adherence matters. And they reported several times how they had to adjust the study to make this doable and sensible and provide support uh, and remove barriers to entry for this older population. Not just the daily diaries, but having a place that they could uh, email. And then they switched from email to having a phone call, you know, available eight hours a day, because that's what they were using uh, when they had questions or when they, you know, wanted ideas. Uh, so for, for me, adherence matters. And another takeaway uh, take that I took from it is that an intervention has a cost. So, you know, if you're going to have people come every six weeks, if you're going to have these constant check-ins, you see a higher dropout rate. So your intervention had better be effective, you know, had better be more effective than, uh, than the control. Had better be more effective than had you just let them go and do their thing to begin with. And that may be hit. Uh, I think we see in VO2 peak a couple small findings uh, that that may be hit, but you have to be very careful in how you deliver it or you risk losing them and potentially getting worse outcomes than you started. Um, sounds like a rationale for good coaching to me. Uh, to, no, seriously, I mean, it does, doesn't it? Uh, a rationale for good coaching, keeping uh, clients on a program, keeping them engaged. And also, you know, there's no data to help us. This, we're just speculating now. But would, would the dropout rate have been less if there had been some sort of metric that the clients themselves were engaged in that they could log, right? Like we see in our clients when somebody's press goes from 125 to 135 uh, or they're pushing more weight uh, on the prowler for their hit protocol or they're, you know, or they're looking at their, their peak heart rate or something like that. And they can actually see that they're making progress with their training. So uh, this, is, this is one thing I, I respected about the researchers. It was thorough. They were honest you know, about their findings. I felt like, I felt like they stretched it a little bit. They stretched a little bit beyond the data, but not by much, not nearly as much as we've seen in some of our reviews. 
Uh, and they readily acknowledged one of the things they said is like, hey, this was 2012. Like we didn't have the internet. If we were going to do it now, they say it in uh, in the response. That was interesting. Going back and forth. It? Yeah. Yeah. People, they're like, yeah, if, if we were to do it now, we totally would have done this to, to improve adherence, to get better information across. So uh, I think yeah. there is in in the, the if only we'd had true coach or whatever <laughs> yeah. right whatever whatever the metric yeah. was yeah i think uh, you have you have an acknowledgement of of how uh important the individual is and if we're going to reach that bottom 75 percent who chose not to participate in the study like that kind of group even more so because they're less self-motivated to to participate okay guys just you know drag them by gunpoint very, very good. Uh, wow, that was fun. Um, you guys did a really, really great job um, picking that apart for us. And uh, any final words before I let you go? I think we, I think we pretty much picked all the meat off of this one. Um, I really, really appreciate you guys uh, taking the time to break the study down for us. And um, see you next time. Thanks a lot. CJ Next Coker, time, thank you. Victoria thank you. Volkov. Take care. Take care.